two, one, and we are live with Ajit. How are you, my friend, Ajit? Very good, very good. What a delight to be with you. I know we have been scheduling this for some time. Yeah. One of those things that sometimes take more than one try to make it happen. Very happy to be here. Delighted to, to be with you as well. Um, and just excited, I guess, about our conversation. Uh, and, and, you know, before we do that, you know, I should say Happy New Year. <laughs> A very happy new year to you. One of the things that I learned uh, a couple of years ago mm. is that people do not watch the video uh, in a similar time frame to the time it is being recorded. So sometimes wishing people a happy new year and they are watching it in May, the context is not set for the viewer. So I, <laughs> yeah. yeah, this one I'm going to upload today. So here, I'm just going to fix my focus here a bit too. But yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, but today people will get it. So, uh, but yeah, happy new year. You know, I wish you the, the best of everything, everything, health, yeah. wealth, and all of it in 20, uh, 2021. Happy new year to all of humanity as in what a year. So I'm like, I'm 50 years old and have never seen such a year. I've seen great years. I've seen really bad years, but never thought I would see this 2020. Right. What a what a year. What a year it was. And, you know, I'm sure we'll we'll get into that as well. I usually start with, you know, where did we meet the first time? Do you remember? Yes, <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Physically, physically, we have met a total of once, if I'm not mistaken. OK, um, OK. Can't be sure of the year, but most likely it was 2015 plus or minus one year. Uh, you, along with your two co-founders of Unicoin, yeah. had set up a set up a investors roadshow mm. uh, where I was present as a prospective investor from Mumbai Angels, which at right. that point was India's largest angel network. And, uh, you know, India's foremost crypto lawyer, Nishit Desai himself was present in that room. And you conducted most of that presentation. So that is when I met you the first time. I don't think I have physically met you again in these last couple of years. So Right, right. Actually, we talked about that recently too. That that's so interesting. That uh, that I mean, I, I know exactly the day you're talking about. And Mumbai Angels, you know, did end up investing in Unocoin. Uh, uh, I, yes. I think later on or something like that. And and you know, I was, I was not in, correct, correct. I wasn't personally part of the syndicate that invested, but yeah, okay. I know yeah, along yeah. with Bloom Ventures, some Mumbai Angel investors also invested. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I've actually had our pit on the show. I've, uh, I've had, yeah, it's been, it's been fun. Um, and, and so Ajit, let's maybe dive into it. You know, um, I always say like, whereas a lot of the podcasts out there are all about all time highs. I'm, you know, I like that stuff. I obviously it's exciting, but I don't, I don't find, I'm not a, tr like, I, I'm not an active trader. Like I like building trading platforms, obviously I'm not a trader. And so for me, the price is really, I sometimes say the least exciting thing about Bitcoin, you know? And so the thing that really excites me about Bitcoin are the stories behind Bitcoin, the, the people in Bitcoin, right? Cause what is Bitcoin? It's ones and zeros. It's code on, you know, people's computers. Um, so it's nothing really. It's just, it's a figment of our imagination. It is a reality, but it's also, you know, as much Maya as it is reality. And so it's really the humanity and kind of the people behind it and the purpose behind it that gives it life. And so you, I consider to be obviously, you know, a very, very important figure given your role within the Bitcoin community in India and globally. And so um, so I wanted to spend this time just, you know, putting a, a spotlight on your story. And, you know, when I say your story, I mean, not like your, like I said, your elevator pitch, but kind of like some people start with their parents meeting. Some people start with their first <laughs> job. Some people start wherever, wherever you feel comfortable. So with that, I'll, I'll maybe, uh, yeah, like, turn it over to you. Yeah. So there are two uh, significant influences which uh, directed the course of the rest of my life. One of them was that way back in 1982, in fact, I remember it was October 82. And there's a reason why that date has been documented. And I can't forget it. Uh, I was 12 years old and uh, I entered the stock market as an investor. As a 12 year old, I didn't have my own money. Of course, I was using my father's money. And one of the drivers of the, or rather the only driver of that is that my father had and continues to have very poor eyesight. So things like filling up forms or reading prospectuses or information memorandum. Uh, I was the chosen son to do that. And uh, I kept helping him with the primary issuances, IPOs from 1982 to about 1985. When having collected pocket money for around three years, I, at the age of 15, 
uh, purchase stock with my own money. Wasn't oh. too much money, but it was my own money. So I got into the investment space mm-hmm. very, very early on in life. For I instance, see. when I was a student of engineering, which would be between the ages of 17 and 21, I would quite regularly, like let's say once a week, mm-hmm. stock, uh, stop by my stockbroker's office mm-hmm. on the way back home from engineering school. So I got into investment early on. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. given that uh, I did not have to support a family or really needed you know, any significant uh, risk cover, mm-hmm. I would always choose very high risk uh, investments, primarily because I wanted to make very high returns. This led me over the course of the next decade, which between the ages of 20 and 30, mm-hmm. to invest in everything, right? From comic books, mm-hmm. to uh, baseball cards, to st- postage stamps, to art, to coins, to metal, to obviously a lot of stock. Uh, So I was always on the forefront of looking at opportunities. I shared in collective investment schemes, plantations, which means teak wood plantations and bunch of those. So that was one significant influence on my life. The fact that I would always look for interesting and not very widely known investment opportunities. Mm. On the other hand, the second of the two most important influences on me were technology. So I did my computer engineering between the years uh, 87 and 91. And this is when things were just about to explode. Before I completed my engineering, the Y2K or the earliest, you know, in uh, the earliest, uh, uh, let us say, uh, interest in the Y2K problem started coming Mm. up. A lot of people from India started working on projects in the US, money Uh started flowing in, people started going to the US. Words like artificial intelligence became a reality. And in the year 1990, we were told that, you know, AI is everything and you engineers are not even going to get jobs because computers are going to do everything. And that is a story we heard for like about 25 years following that. And uh, so this twin approach of uh, investment and technology uh, eventually led me to start investing in startups, tech startups. I made my first uh, startup investment. Uh, what would today be called an angel investment in the year 1998 in a ed tech startup called Padai.com. Sorry, I'm back. And uh, also uh, between that year and 2010, I made about a dozen, to be precise, 13 angel investments, then moved on to becoming part of angel syndicates, working with VCs, etc. This made a perfect segue for mm. me to you know, start looking at Bitcoin. I see. Uh, hey, hey, Ajit, I, I, I was gonna say before we get into the Bitcoin story, which is obviously gonna be the focus of this one. Um, I, ironically, the last thing I bring up in all my interviews is this question around AI, and I was just gonna quickly ask you: Do you think yeah. that narrative has actually changed, or is it more of the same in the sense that is it more just rhetoric? And um, yeah, I'm just curious. Before so just we get into one Bitcoin, step, yeah. one step, even taking one step back from mm. your question. If we keep AI aside and we look at all the technological innovation that I have seen unfold in the world in front of my eyes, so cloud computing or much before that, client server architecture, eventually mobile devices, the mobile Mm -hmm. internet, e-commerce, digital wallets, and a bunch of other things. Uh, uh, What I have found is that every one of these technological innovations, which gets mass adoption, is democratizing in nature. That means it gives power to the people. The only one where I am worried it is going to be the other way around is artificial intelligence, where some overlords who have control of data Mm -hmm. and can mine it and can use machine learning or what have you uh, might actually turn out to be our overlords, you know, the people who have access to private data, etc. So to that extent, AI is probably the antithesis of all technological evolution that has occurred. Of course, when we are using Google and we get great search results as a result of machine learning, it helps everybody. So it has a democratizing feature to it. But if, you know, uh, let us say it falls into the wrong hands, and I don't want to make this sound like a conspiracy theory, but there's Mm -hmm. a possibility that even, Mm -hmm. for instance, the Google example I gave you uh, might very well mean that now Google is the only search engine we will ever have. Mm. Because now they have so much data. So again, it is not a democratizing force as far as the search engine industry is concerned. It just probably helps the common folk who are doing searches. Now, as far as answering your question directly is concerned. So, you know, 
in the year 1991 which is the mm. academic years beginning 1990 ending 91 uh, we had artificial intelligence as an mm. elective subject uh, which we could take as students of computer engineering and to the best of my knowledge mm. that was the very first time such an elective was available anywhere in india Interesting. AI was part of other electives and other Which, subjects. Which where did you study? All by, I did it in University of Mumbai. In Mumbai, uh, cool, cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So my engineering college was called Vivekanand. But uh, the interesting thing is that as a whole subject by itself, according to me, it was the first time it was offered. Coincidentally, I didn't take that subject, but because some of my classmates did, mm. the interesting aspect of that was that we thought neural networks, which were probably the most popular implementation of or model around AI. at that point of time uh would take over everything and like i said that didn't happen for 20 years so all the things that you know change the world overnight take like decades before that overnight happens i do not think that ai is hype i however believe that pretty much like how computing or personal computing changed the world mm -hmm. the first thing we did was we used personal computers to do things that we were already doing but mm. do them smarter better faster right as an automate what was not auto what was manual right okay. before the more important uh, applications started coming up mm. wherein we thought okay forget the just the automation bit can we get more creative and that is where a decade and a half later things mm. got a little better mm. to wonder why my screen goes off and my mic goes off that is the time i take to sneeze Uh, because i definitely oh, well don't want to nice okay <laughs> <laughs> okay 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 so, I, so i'm sitting with like fastest fingers first you know so that i don't have to like do that and i have like tissue paper and i've come prepared right awesome. i did not Love want it. to miss this opportunity because oh, this, man, this is very exciting. i'm so i'm so appreciative i know you mentioned you're feeling a bit under the weather so thank you so much uh, for coming on that's correct so i think that uh, yeah so short answer to your question is that AI is going to be revolutionary, life-altering, altering the course of human civilization. Mm. But I do not think we know how mm. yet. Got it. Got it. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay, so let's let's get into it then. Sorry, I cut you off when you're getting to the juiciest part. You're saying, you know, you're kind of you're you're changing gears into Bitcoin. Yeah. So so it's crazy that I started, you know, looking at Bitcoin only in the year two thousand fourteen. Which is okay, like okay. very late, very late for a person. <laughs> Not like anymore. Me, Nowadays, people <laughs> hearing that is going to be like, "What? 2014?" No, <laughs> but again, I did not get into Bitcoin in the sense of actually oh. participating in it. I, you know, was attracted by the crazy price graph, and it was something which you know nerdy weirdos participate in, and some people believe in, and it seemed like a cult kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah. I started looking <laughs> at it. Yeah. and then i looked at it just did a very cursory uh, understanding of what is this thing oh people believe it's some form of money and uh, nobody controls it there's no government and what nonsense as and i just i just brushed it aside as right. this is not going to, <laughs> this is not going to happen <laughs> and then because of the price graph attracting me again and again mm -hmm. i decided that you know what at the very least i'm going to look closer at it and for approximately 2 years right i studied a lot as in if i were to estimate i probably spent close to 500 hours at that Whoa. point of time unlike today mm. uh, there weren't any online courses in fact the only course was on coursera a uh, very good course but extraordinarily boring course by princeton <laughs> university good in content but not very well delivered uh so that is the course i did in mm. addition i read up all the articles i could read up of course mm. read the bitcoin white paper and then in september of 2016 mm. i mustered the courage of buying 1000 rupees which is something like 20 dollars or so at that point maybe a little less than that uh 1000 rupees worth of a fraction of bitcoin mm. and i as soon as i purchased it i immediately also sold it to see if that money comes back to me as in can i like send fiat and off on ramp and then come off ramp and when that happened i said hey this seems like fun and then <laughs> i started putting some money into it at that point of time if you will allow me to use indian rupees bitcoin was at around 40000 rupees so close to around 700 dollars okay. uh, plus or minus a little and i bought and sold a little bit of it it did not move for some time and then it suddenly moved so 40000 became like 55000 and then 70000 which is 
close to about a thousand dollars, maybe a little under it. And I said, "Hey, it's not going to get much more from here." <laughs> <laughs> Unfamous, infamous last words. So I just sat tight, and then it just kept going up. And then I uh, got in touch with a lot of people who operate in this space. Mm. Uh, you were with Unocoin. I was in touch with people who were competing with Unocoin in the market. Mm. I took up in January of nine uh, of two thousand and eighteen. Mm-hmm. I became head of the blockchain and cryptocurrency committee, which was at that time and probably continues to be the premier industry body for crypto companies in India. And uh, shortly thereafter, uh, Zepay, which is India's Uh, you know along with juno coin one of the two earliest crypto exchanges in india mm-hmm. hired me as their uh, ceo this was about march of 18 in march of 2018 so that's what now almost 3 years ago now now no yes uh, three but you know Ma- yeah 3 Yeah, but you know the most remarkable thing about that is not that it's three years because it could have been any number of years. Yeah. Except that the Reserve Bank of India circular also came in March of eighteen. Right. Oh. That is why it is so remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like you're talking about the circular because there there had been the like a cir- few notices, but you're talking about the circular. Okay, okay, okay. The circular. Thirteen days. Thirteen days into me becoming CEO of a cryptocurrency exchange. Yeah. Our Reserve Bank of India finally like says welcome. Know, pulls, <laughs> yeah, and, and interestingly, though I do not totally buy into the narrative of peacetime CEO and wartime CEO, mm. but if I were to force that narrative, I was probably a peacetime CEO mm. uh, by nature. And suddenly, I became a wartime CEO. You know, like firefighting and stuff. So it was a crazy time. So what did? Okay, so maybe for those people. Who don't know what we're talking about? Do you want to maybe in a sentence or two or a couple of however long you want to kind of uh, yeah, at least yeah. capture sure. what that was, and and I think it's important too. This isn't just a story, right? This is a story that I think is relevant to people in India, but really everywhere, right? I mean, this is something is like uh, okay. So yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so again, taking a step back, you know, if you look at uh, governments around the world. Barring a few, which might be okay, there are two categories of governments. One are these small financial hubs, island nations, who you know are whether it's Bermuda, Isle of Man, Malta, yeah, yeah. bunch of others, who are very, very uh, accepting of new technology, primarily because they want to attract foreign businesses to incorporate there, etc. Mm. And then there are a few others, such as Switzerland, Liechtenstein, etc., who are by their very nature very uh, accommodative of innovation. But barring a few exceptions like that. one has to admit that bitcoin mm. or cryptocurrency or distributed ledger technology or what have you yeah, yeah, yeah. can seem a little threatening to the way the current system works so mm. i don't blame them for that and uh, way back uh, from i think a couple of years before 2018 reserve bank of india had been issuing uh, public warnings about participating in uh, bitcoin or cryptocurrency and those were more in the nature of trying to uh, you know not fall for ponzi schemes or scams in general now in 2018 what reserve bank of india finally did in march of 2018 was issue a notification that uh, prevented entities licensed by the reserve bank of india again for those of you who may not know reserve bank of india is a central banker in india pretty much like the federal reserve in the us or the monetary authority of singapore in singapore etc so in 2018 in march what reserve bank of india did was said that anybody who is licensed by us which basically means almost anybody in the money system which is banks non banking financial corporations debit cards credit cards digital wallets payment gateways all of these guys cannot allow the money to flow through their system mm. which goes in and out of the bitcoin system so for instance uh, cryptocurrency exchanges couldn't have bank accounts uh, retail customers who would buy or sell bitcoin and use money from their bank accounts would have their bank accounts shut etc mm. so this uh, was a very very harsh uh, uh, regulation and given that the underlying asset which is bitcoin itself mm-hmm, was mm-hmm. never deemed officially to be illegal or you know otherwise something that indian citizens need to stay away from given that uh, to come up with a regulation which says you know what we are not taking as a central banker can't take a view that bitcoin is bad or bitcoin should be illegal that is a uh, you know the policy makers the law makers have to make that decision but then for 
the reserve bank of india had to say that you can't use a bank account mm. effectively was banning cryptocurrency right and uh, so this is what uh, i referred to when i said that 13 days into my job as ceo of a major crypto exchange we got the central banker saying you know what for all practical purposes i'm putting a stop to this mm interesting interesting have you ever heard of uh you know elon musk has a famous quote i think one of his friends told him that uh, this one which is entrepreneurship is like chewing glass and staring into the abyss <laughs> <laughs> you know oh so man i wonder I if that resonates work, <laughs> you know, have you worked with entrepreneurs a lot i must also uh, tell you that i the see the romance of entrepreneurship and by the way I don't know if you can see the t-shirt that I'm wearing. Oh man, What? no I can't. That... Oh, beautiful. What a beautiful <laughs> shirt. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I think that uh, the romance around entrepreneurship or startups is what attracts so many people to start up and sometimes that ro- the romance ends soon. Soon you get wedded to the startup and you know it's in the absence of romance it's no fun so yeah as in chewing glass and all of those things make for <laughs> make for great tweets but i think that we have to you know look at as you see for example when everybody says that banks will shut down and governments will fall and bitcoin mm. will rain i understand the philosophical underpinnings of that mm. but at the same time i think that this also delays uh, the mainstream acceptance and normalization of crypto yeah Yeah, yeah, definitely. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, so I mean, like I said, the the goal was really to kind of help capture, I mean, you know, your story in this. So I guess what happens? Like how do you react to this, you know? I mean, I know what happened on this side of the fence, but really curious, you know, what um I mean, you know, and obviously uh whatever you can share and and you know, stuff that you might think might be instructive, you know, for other entrepreneurs because uh, I know I think I feel that there are probably others either going through it or maybe about to go through it or have gone through it and 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 uh yeah i mean you know a lot of people just think that oh everything just happens you know but it doesn't it's like it's a function of like people like doing things right yeah. um yeah yeah so curious so what what are the things that you guys choose chose to do or you know i mean because that pays always been kind of a a model um company in the space you know i've publicly always uh, also shared that uh, that 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 one of the originators or i think probably the originator mahin is is like a, a really really good friend of mine when i see him at conferences i i give him big hugs and he's actually i think he enabled me to get some of my first bitcoin so um so nothing but love for zepay but like curious how did you guys respond to it and you know and 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 if you could go back are there other things that you might do or yeah just i mean that's always a hard one to say so so here's the thing Uh, since you put the spotlight on zepe it is very important for me to point out that for about a year now i have not been with zepe and anything that i say is not from zepe's point of view right, right because right. i'm not an authorized spokesperson and i'm not with zepe anymore so you'll have to get somebody from zepe to speak on behalf of zepe but i can Absolutely. definitely and those guys have reached industry. out to me those guys have reached out to me and they actually picked up on the fact that i spoke positively about them in one of my interviews with naimish and some of these guys and they they were really kind about it and they even like sent emails within a lot of the other entrepreneurs in india just kind of connecting the dots because i do believe that you know we're all in this together like i mean i'm all about competing and all like i get that i mean there's always a front that we'll all be competing on but i also um think it's good to you know just kind of build everyone else up as well yeah so i think that you, what you have talked about in the last like 20 seconds yeah. i wish it were true for the industry what happened is <laughs> that no and that's very important because as an industry the crypto industry at right. that point was quite in its nascency there were yeah, five yeah. players uh, which was zepay unocoin coin secure uh, btcx india and coinx mm. uh, who mm. were quite major then there were others such as pocket bets coino bitzozo and i mm-hmm. i don't know who i have forgotten mm. and uh, uh what while these people were quite united and we tried to put together cobble together a legal strategy mm. which was around uh trying to get a stay which means okay we will get into discussing whether the reserve bank of india circular was legal illegal should be allowed should not be allowed but for now until that finding is arrived that let us stay it so that you know the damage is not caused even if uh, you know it is determined later that it should have been nullified which eventually two years later it was nullified but because the entire crypto industry was not united 
Mm. Somebody went and took some legal action which was not coherent with uh, the action taken by the rest of the industry, and I think that was a huge setback. And a moment back, like you said, you know that we are an industry, though we may compete on some fronts, that we are all part of the same story. Uh, I wish that were true then. I think it is more true today than then, but not as much as it should be. Looking mm. back at the software or information technology boom in India, you will probably have always heard of a industry body called NASCOM. Mm. NASCOM did phenomenal service to the Indian software industry. Right. And I believe that in the absence of NASCOM. Indian India would not have been as big a deal for software as it eventually turned out to be. Mm. I think something like this is necessary for those who are on the cutting edge, or in the case of crypto, the bleeding edge of innovation. Mm. And I think that if in India, and this is probably true, this is surely true for all other parts of the world, if as an industry mm-hmm. we do, are unable to come together. Mm. and do be- the benefit of the industry while competing in customer acquisition and increasing our trading volumes and what have you that's okay but if we cannot act as a mature industry uh, we really are doomed uh, luckily i find that in many other parts of the world including in singapore when i was there for about a year and a half i have found that in- industry players are behaving like mature industry players and by the way even in india today i think we are far more mature than we were Uh, two years ago or three years ago, but a lot more needs to be done. Mm-mm-mm-mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally agree. Um, yeah, yeah. Actually, that was one of my reasons to 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 kind of start doing some of these podcasts as well, because you know, um, like you said, you know, I think a lot of people have kind of this belief that oh, Bitcoin is going to be banned or whatever. There's no point in you know building a Bitcoin business, but you know, um. But if you, there is a way to build a business within the space, and and like you said, in two years, uh, eventually the court did uh, kind of decide in the favor of uh, the Bitcoin community, right? And or whatever you want to say, they they like the you banking. Know, people should know. Returned. Mm-hmm. Right, people should know that even taxi hailing apps like Uber or it's mm. you know the Indian equivalent called uh, Ola cabs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know. O- OTT platforms like Netflix and their Indian equivalents, or even TV channels, or a bunch of these play, uh, you know, b- new businesses, at a certain point of time were not completely in the white area of the laws, and there were shades of grey. Mm-hmm. So every one of these innovative businesses, digital wallets, peer-to-peer lending, so many of these have actually been either blatantly illegal. or at least having a cloud of an illegality on it so innovation is going to face this challenge because the law was not written imagining that such a thing could happen right so for people to be skeptical and worry that you know things may not work out is reasonable as in sure be skeptical do your wait and watch but that does not mean that those who are going ahead and trying to adopt innovation faster than others are necessarily doing something wrong Right, yeah, so I think yeah, that yeah. Uh, there will be early adopters, there will be late adopters, there will be knee-jerk reactions. Uh, Ivan, just hope that you know this—the axe doesn't fall on your neck as a consequence of a knee-jerk reaction, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know what you mean. It's, uh, it's kind of a, yeah, it's a, it's a wild world. That's for sure. That's right. Um, no, but anyways, I, I, I like, yeah, yeah, like you. Sorry, go ahead, Ajit. Sunny, so you know when I when I said that you know one hopes that the axe of knee-jerk reaction doesn't fall on your neck. You know what example was coming to me in my mind? Yeah, something that you know coin faced. Oh God! Okay, let's may talk I, about it. May, may, may <laughs> talk absolutely, about it? absolutely. Yeah. So what happened is that after uh, the RBI circular, mm. uh, there was a TV interview on CNBC. CNBC has uh, multiple channels in India because of language based distinction but they have a english channel called CNBC TV 18 where mm. the editor Shireen Bhan talked to Subhash Garg who was the secretary of the department of economic affairs and said that you have banned bitcoin he said we are not banned bitcoin we have just said you can't use bank accounts for it so she said does that not mean it's banned so he said no buy it with cash i think he was being tongue in cheek but uh, 
you know, but he said it, right? So several people considered that if they were to, for instance, do the business in cash and completely above board, as in record the transactions, probably it could be done in a valid way. And there was this cute little exchange called Unicoin, which you may be familiar with, Sunny. Of course, of course. <laughs> which decided, and I wonder whether you're going to edit this out, but there's no reason to, because it's very important. Which decided that, you know, we could automate this. And, you know, mobile bills have been paid using cash collection machines and a variety of other things have happened using cash collection machines. So they set that a cash collection machine up for, uh, you know, a certain small amount of uh, money that could be used to add to your account over Unicoin. And uh, I don't know whether it was their doing or the media's doing, but this machine got called a Bitcoin ATM. Now we all know that ATMs are regulated. You know, people can't just go and set up an ATM and all hell broke loose. The knee-jerk reaction, the axe of the knee-jerk reaction falling on the neck did fall on Unicoin's neck and a bunch of craziness has ensued. And what made it worse, according to me, was that uh, other than the pain that Unicoin had to suffer, as in con highly condemnable, but more importantly, from the national point of view, from the country's point of view, some fairly important people in very mm. responsible positions uh, took a rather unfortunate view about this incident. Luckily, it was sorted eventually. But mm. uh, these are some of the problems in being you know, part of uh, something which is very innovative that you are going to be misunderstood. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah. Oh, I remember that like it was yesterday. Uh, yeah. I mean, just for the record, though, I mean, and not not to throw anyone under the bus, but I, that was definitely not my idea. Um, but but I do stand by the fact that um, if you look at it from a first principles perspective, um, I don't think there was necessarily anything wrong in that either, in the sense that Nishit Desai and Associates, the, the firm that ended up, you know, eventually helping fight and win, they to that day said, you know what, this is not illegal. You're doing KYC, you're, you're doing this in a way that, um, you know, serves your customers, it doesn't violate the bank ban. And, and the day after they were my, you know, my co-founders were let go. And ironically, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but in the court case itself, the final thing that the judges brought up, you know, earlier this year was show us an example of where one person's personal liberty and their constitution was violated. And it was actually that story that you brought up and Harish's story that was brought up as kind of like a testimony. So, um, so yeah, I agree. Innovation can be messy. And I think that, you know, that was a really, really hard lesson to, to learn because I think, like you said, I think a lot of people paid the price. Um, but like you said, Harish and Satvik, they paid, you know, the ultimate price. I don't think anyone could yeah. imagine, you know, what happened. You know, and, and I think similar things happened to co-founders of ZebPay back in 20, you know, 2013, if you recall, like in the sense that bad things, bad things, right? Uh, well, seemingly bad things. Remember buy, sell Bitcoin and ZebPay. My, my point is, is that I think that, but at the same time, you know, people shouldn't stop innovating or stop doing things, right? Like, like to this day, we think launching it. Did you hear like someone deployed a network of uh, Bitcoin banks in India? I don't know who, but I saw it in the news or something. I don't know if it's going to work or not, but I still think like, you know, I live in Canada. I, within a five minute block of my house, I could go to an ATM machine like that. Bitcoin ATM machine. They're all called Bitcoin ATM machines. So wow. I, I mean, I think I think there was definitely oversight, maybe in calling it that. I think I think the companies also issued an apology. Um, they should have called it maybe a kiosk, but you know. But like, uh, and I think the, the the media had to had some part in blame because they ran with that story and you know kind of went viral. And I think everyone, but it's uh, it definitely it definitely you know. It was a sad story. I, I actually, in fact, I've got to interview Satvik about it still. I haven't done that yet. We, we've gotten to like 2015, but I think this would be a good time to bring it up with him. Be like, hey, Satvik, how was that? You know, <laughs> you, you know, when you're doing that interview, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, please allow me to be on your side of the table in addition to you, of course. And let me also ask some questions because I would love I'm it. You that we should do a we should was, do a call. 
yes because it was a very very bad time for the indian crypto industry right and like i said other than the direct pain that the founders of unocoin underwent mm. uh, which cannot be you know underestimated uh, the fact is that uh, i noticed a lot of people in fairly responsible positions making utterly stupid you know comments about this entire episode and which were as in i have seen somebody make a really stupid uh, comment and then the association to which that person belonged came and made a clarification that they do not agree with this person's views but then made a stupid comment themselves and so you know one thing i was hoping you were going to mention was the the nascom debacle because there was a really <laughs> funny incident where it's like the one main person at nascom said something about you know bitcoin and then kind of retract do you do you know i'm talking about or no because because i thought you were you helped kind of change that there no you know what i'm talking about or no i mean there's been so much I, stuff I, in I, india I, man it's I, I like just... we could write a book ajit when's the book coming out buddy <laughs> <laughs> you know what's very interesting is by the time the court case was done yeah 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 uh, a lot of the exchanges which are prominent exchanges in india and continue to be so seemed like the ones that had actually won the case and of course that is at least partially true because they did participate but you know when the court case started mm. uh it was just very very few of us and a lot of exchanges that eventually were in the uh, scene did not even exist then so hence a lot of what has actually happened has never been fully documented so the book and the movie and the netflix movie all have yet to be made <laughs> but but before then before then people can go to buildingonbitcoin.com and watch all these interviews <laughs> cuz guess what i am interviewing everybody everybody okay uh, you know who else i interviewed the ceo of wazirex yeah nishal great guy yeah the, i got his I, and if you want to know behind the scenes i was never saying to go atm because I spent eight years in hardware doing robotics before I got into Bitcoin, and I know okay. that hardware is called hardware because it's hard. <laughs> you don't do that. My my suggestion to my team internally was we should be doing P to P. Right. Right. <laughs> right? No, I, I agree. There were various ways. That was the obvious that play. That was the obvious play. No. But Nishal was smart enough to capitalize on it, and today he's one of the top five thousand websites in the world. you know credit right. to him. look at look at coinex are you familiar with coinex so coinex let's talk about it i love behind. this interview go go yeah. let's talk about coinex <laughs> so coinex came from behind and beat everybody else right in no and time they, yeah, yeah and that they did go the peer to peer the p2b way and mm. in a fairly uh, i would say intelligent way as in i did not fully follow that because we were having our own set of problems in india at that point of time but p2p did not turn out to be the solution for coinex sure. as it did for some others why right? do you think that was so, do you know or you have you not studied it closely enough like was it so the, was I mean, no well, yeah what might it have been cuz cuz coinex also married the order book with the p2p right or did they not cuz i think nishal they, like that that's the point he highlights is that that was their aha moment was when they married the order I, book i'll tell you what one of the things is that uh, Uh, while the newer exchanges such as Nichols, Wazirx, and uh, Coin DCX and Bit BNS, etc., while I think they have done a great job, uh, and that is why they continue to do well, but at that point of time, there were these old and largish exchanges, which would probably be Unocoin, Zpay, and uh, uh, Coinex, and then were the new, upcoming, very small, single-digit number of people probably. Uh, so what happened is that. volumes revenues commissions whatever name you want to give uh, to the earnings which were very small sized probably seemed okay for some of the newer exchanges because they had not yet gone on the path of a lot of expenses but for the older guys who already were spending a lot of money with large teams large offices etc they could not adopt you know the more nimble ways of operation which is why the older larger guys took more of a beating that is my mm-hmm. that is my belief yeah 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 the coinex i mean it's been like a minefield if you think about it like uh <laughs> trying to build a business of bitcoin can be challenging it's getting i think less and less hopefully so because of 
you know, because of all the battles and the battle wounds that people like you and, you know, everyone has to show, but, um, but yeah, but okay. So anything else? I mean, I don't know anything else you want to touch on. I mean, I'm just, I mean, we didn't talk too much about Bitcoin. I mean, uh, anything, <laughs> anything you want to mention in terms of like maybe your relationship with it and, and your understanding of it and how it's evolved or, or things that you might want to help dispel out there. Cause a lot of people, yeah, Mm. naturally naturally a lot of things right so yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of what to prioritize but the fact is that every time i talk to people who i otherwise have a lot of respect for who are in the world of finance technology regulation or spheres which are you know important for bitcoin also and let's say these are people who just do not have not studied bitcoin or try to understand it it actually offends me to see that uh, how lightly they take it and how they tend to you know poo poo it for instance uh, about a month maybe month and a half ago i was on a major tv channel and you will mm. notice that when i say good things i name the counterparty and when i say bad things i don't name them mm. but i was on a major tv channel and uh, one of the exchange owners uh, who was also a co panelist on the tv channel uh, talked about a systematic investment plan wherein you can invest a certain fixed amount of uh, money into Bitcoin over a certain you know fixed period, such as daily, weekly, monthly, whatever. Some uh, strategy, an averaging strategy, which is actually very common in uh, mutual funds, for instance, all over the world, most specifically in India also. And when this person mentioned an SIP or a systematic investment plan, the journalist uh, was like almost like, oh, what does Bitcoin have an SIP? As in it was like, Clearly, the person had never heard of this. So being grossly underestimated compared to the traditional world of finance is something that irks me quite a lot, right? So you meet somebody who like, you know, says, hey, you know what, you just don't understand. Banks don't work this way. And what they do then is they point out how Bitcoin is different from a bank with the assumption that all such differences, hence, are shortcomings of Bitcoin, I'm like, you know, the differences that you have pointed are all correct, but why would you think that that is a shortcoming of Bitcoin and not of the bank, right? So uh, as in one of the things that is my pet peeve and things that, you know, really gets me unhappy mm -hmm. is when people from the traditional space uh, will say things like, oh, but Bitcoin is so volatile. The price mm -hmm. of Bitcoin is so volatile. So I'm like, you know, if you have only invested in bond markets, you know, where mm. yields could vary a bit, you would look at the stock market and say the stock market is wild. It is not wild. It is in the nature of that instrument. So you have to consider the nature of the instrument and then accordingly make any bets that you want to, right? And to begin with, you know, just like a bond is a statement or rather a securitized version of debt, Equity is a securitized version of ownership of a, you know, a company, a, a corporation. Bitcoin is not an asset of that type. While it can be traded, you know, pretty much like a commodity note could be traded while it would refer, you know, the underlying could be frozen, concentrated orange juice or pork bellies or what have you. But the thing is that Bitcoin, other than representing a certain value, which the market has attributed to it, uh, it represents a lot more. It represents a new way of doing things. It represents an underlying technology which has huge applications, etc. And when people do not spend any time trying to understand this, uh, it does bug me. The only thing is because I'm, you know, much older than people regard the usual Bitcoin participant being, as in they usually think it's like a 20-year-old who is participating in the market or somebody who does not understand anything, right? When they look at me, they kind of tend to be a little gentler in their opinions or you know thrusting it down my throat because they know one that i am not that millennial or gen x gen y gen z or whatever they talk keep talking about and they also know that you know i will probably have a response to some of the things they say so i i, I do meet kinder opposition but opposition nonetheless yeah yeah uh, so is there, I was going to say, um, one of the questions I like to ask is, is there anything that you believe to be true in Bitcoin that most others in Bitcoin would disagree with you on? The answer is yes. But then, you know, I already have all the no-coiners who hate me for being a 
I shouldn't say Bitcoiner because that that word has a specific meaning. But let's say being in the crypto space, now when I share that with you, you know, I'll be hated on both sides. What? <laughs> despite oh, that, okay, I got it. Okay. This, despite that, I think that uh, the traditional system of finance and the uh, cryptocurrency based monetary system have ample opportunity to coexist. it is not like voldemort and harry potter that you know one must die for the other to survive i don't, have you have you read all harry potter oh yeah i've read harry potter and not all of so, them so but i've know, read i've read a few you of them you know professor trelawney who mm. was a divination teacher mm-hmm. had actually made a prophecy which was in a crystal glass which uh, voldemort wanted because you know mm. that would define how voldemort may or may not survive basically that's what professor trelawney said that you know until one of them kills the other that one also would not be able to survive i don't think that is what's happening here i think that for bitcoin to thrive hmm. uh, people in the bitcoin space have to not see themselves at loggerheads with the traditional system because what this does is that hmm. it gets the traditional finance people uh, insecure Mm. of course to begin with first they would ridicule the bitcoin people but let us say we have passed through those cycles it gets them a little insecure for good reason because you know governments central bankers institutions want to have much more control than a public blockchain based token allows them to and when they get insecure they are likely to take major reactions which is not going to be good for anybody so for now the one thing that i in response to your question there's something i believe that a lot of people in the bitcoin space do not it would be this that you know hey let's work together let's not try to say that we are better so you don't need to exist got it got it got it yeah i like that um um okay so i, I was going to ask you uh you know you mentioned this thing and so one thing that comes to mind did you hear the news that just broke in the last 24 hours um ajit about the i think it's called the occ the the office of comp control it's like the regulator of regulators for the banks in united states and they just said i don't want to like misspeak here but i think i'm paraphrasing here they said that open blockchain like bitcoin ethereum um can be used as like similar to swift right i i, I did read that i also read a lot of people's understanding and interpretation of that most <laughs> specifically that uh, you know people are i think wrongly assuming that this opens a floodgates for central bank uh, digital currency i personally think that cbdcs did not need such approval banks could have done that by themselves uh, but the fact that public blockchains of the type of bitcoin for instance the fact that they can now be used as networks that formal institutions participate in i think is 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 crazy as in it's amazing i i i don't see banks rushing give me a second hold on yeah 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 sorry man i'm like kind of dying here and you'll be surprised that i'm sitting with like two rolls of these as in i knew i would go through them but all the same i think that this i don't see too much action coming out of this because it is a very high level statement of direction or intent but eventually when we see significant adoption uh and opening of floodgates maybe a year down the line or two years down the line uh we may not even remember that it was this day that actually created the opening for that right 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 uh yeah i think that's pretty exciting you know i would regarding that comment so i was going to say so cbdcs are essentially a, like a central bank's attempt to disintermediate banks if you think about it right it, it would essentially allow them to create a direct relationship with everyone um i think this is what i'm kind of reading into some lines here okay but just go with me here i think that so like even during the court case this whole thing we talked about in india like from what i know I'm not, i might be misspeaking but i don't think i am our bank was actually a part of the court case meaning they were taking on the central bank with us because they saw how much money there is to be made meaning banks and central banks aren't one and the same right they're they're actually different and so it's to me the most interesting thing that i think that 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 is playing out 
is there's this like dance now between central banks and banks. And I think sent the first fire that was shot. Well, the first first was like Bitcoin, Bitcoin, but then like Facebook really lit things on fire <laughs> because dude, I was at OECD, the Paris, like Jesse from you know, when I was working there, they sent me, they, I got to go uh, talk about, you know, the whole story with Uno coin and all that, but I was there and it was so funny to just be in a room with 2000 regulators. And, and, and then the Libra guy goes up on stage to talk about Libra <laughs> And, you know, people don't care about Bitcoin. Let's be honest. Like you said, most people don't. I mean, now more people are starting to. People don't care about Bitcoin, but everybody cares about Facebook. Everybody cares about <laughs> who doesn't have Facebook. Like who doesn't? Like, so the fact that they said that was like, I think, huge. And then the central banks are like, okay, we've got to do something about it. CBDC. And then I think now banks are starting to go, okay, let us play in the free market. And they all just want to just make money. <laughs> and, and if you really think about Bitcoin and these new uh, crypto assets kind of essentially disintermediate, you know, central banking. Wow. What a mind trip. I think the next play might be if I was a central banker, I would say, oh, yeah, you guys want to play? We're going to hold Bitcoin on our digit on our balance sheet. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> you, yeah. Imagine that, that's the I made that call January 1st on Ryan's show. That's my that's my ludicrous statement to go from our central banks taking us on to them having the awakening where they say we're gonna hold digital gold on our asset asset um sheets so that the value of the rupee can gain value, just like how gold. Got it. So, so central bankers do hold gold, right? As in that's a very well-known fact. Dude, I personally yeah. would be yeah. surprised. Uh, uh, this is not a statement of something I know for a fact, but it is my opinion. Mm. I would be surprised if there aren't governments already. And mm. these probably are not governments of large economies like the US or India mm. or other such, but probably some of the smaller ones. I would be surprised if there aren't sovereign states already that in their treasury are not holding Bitcoin already. I would assume there are those that already do. Maybe they are small, maybe they are not that significant, but maybe they are doing it indirectly. That means it's not as if the central bank of some country is doing it, mm. but maybe they have some sort of a sovereign fund which has an exposure to Bitcoin. So I think to some extent it's happening. To some other, I think that uh, you already said that you made that wild uh, estimate, right? <laughs> now, let me let me Top it. raise one up, raise one up. Let's one. go, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I am saying that in the year 2021, and we are on the fifth day I need of a drum roll. I, I need a drum roll. <laughs> in the year 2021, mm. uh, we would see some central banker, significant central banker, uh, uh, hold some Bitcoin store. Uh, because of the exact same reason that you said. I'm not saying that it'll happen sometime in the future. I'm saying it's going to happen in 2021. So let us see how that goes. <laughs> okay, okay. So who knows, who knows? That would be quite a turnaround. But uh, but like I said, I think things are, because of this Corona thing too, I think things are being really accelerated. Like I think, you know, people are starting to, like you're seeing all these hedge fund managers and big, big kind of reputable people coming out and saying that, you know, did you hear about the Michael Saylor Um thing like the whole public companies in, in the United States now starting to literally see Bitcoin as like a treasury asset as an engineered <laughs> treasury asset I mean wow what a like yeah. like that, that that to me is a precursor to maybe central bank someday seeing you know the the ultimate so, value so let, let, let me ask you as in you know uh, I don't know whether you regard your podcasts more as conversations or interviews so because of because of the lack of that knowledge, because of being ignorant, I'm going to make assumptions and assume that I can ask you questions too. Oh, absolutely. Right? All, all day. <laughs> so at 30, 33, $32,000 a Bitcoin, uh, I'm not asking for financial advice because neither you nor I should have the irresponsibility to, you know, give financial advice to people. But what are you doing? As in, I personally can tell you what I am doing, but what are you doing about it at this price in terms of buying, selling, hodling? What are you doing? Uh, you know, you alluded to the SIP earlier, the systematic investment plan. Yeah. When I used to be a financial advisor, we used to call that dollar cost averaging. Right. To me, the best strategy is live a simple life 
<laughs> don't spend much money <laughs> and uh you know just pay for your basic expenses and then the rest of it every month you know you should have a, you should have an emergency fund and the emergency yeah. fund is what i called fiat meaning you should have at least six months three to six I mean, anyone listening to this yeah, but i'm not a financial advisor anymore None of this should be taken as financial. You should ask your own financial advisor, you know, blah, 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 all the disclaimers, right? Squared. Uh, yeah, yeah. To me, I, I, like I said, I think the ultimate financial strategy is to dollar, is to, like I said, ha first have an emergency fund in fiat so that you can cover your bills if you lose your job, if you, you know, whatever, you have that money in your bank so that you can pay your bills because of the rest of the world you know, that's how they, that's how they work. Um, and then beyond that, once you've reached that level every month, every, every, every penny I make, we make beyond what we need. And, uh, you know, we just, we, 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 we hodl and hodl means um, where you buy Bitcoin with no plan to exit, where there is no number, there's no fiat dollar number that you go, okay, when it hits this, I will finally sell. Hodling means that you're hodling for generations to come, like you're hodling for something much grander than even planet Earth. <laughs> yeah, so, so cool. So my thought, I mean, I cannot disagree with you, but you know, somebody who has not started the dollar cost averaging yet and is today thinking of doing that, that person, as you can imagine, would be, if they look at the price graph, would really wonder whether this is the right time to even start the dollar cost averaging. Because while you know the idea of dollar cost averaging or systematic investment plans is that you should not look at the price to make your purchase decision. I got it. But at the same time, you're going to start sometime, right? So is this the best time? You know, what has happened is that the rapid price movement in the recent past couple of weeks and months has actually led to a lot of paralysis amongst people who have probably made investment decisions way back because now they cannot get themselves to buy at this price. <laughs> Even though they remain convinced of the price. So it's not that they're selling, but they are like, gosh, as in it's worth being this, it's worth being twice of this, but I'm not sure given that Bitcoin has demonstrated its ability to do 85% retracements that <laughs> Whether, you know, well, my my prediction on that one, price. which again I don't like making predictions, but my prediction price wise, um, and but I've been pretty damn accurate, man, with my predictions. I would say, for those people who really know me closely, because I haven't really been doing this YouTube thing for long. Um, but my my prediction is that we're gonna, um, we're gonna ten x in the next year or two. and then we're gonna see a major retracement of maybe seventy percent, and Bitcoin will crash from 300k to 100k <laughs> to 100k and uh it might stay there might stay there for <clears throat> two three years while the industry rebuilds and everybody the whole world thinks we're like the dumbest people ever and like how could you invest them that went from 300k to 100k are you stupid or something but they won't remember that it was worth seven dollars you know when mahin and i met <laughs> so i i you know uh, unfortunately have neither the ability nor any confidence in making such statements, right? I remain positive, bullish, mm. but I don't have a price graph prediction. Let's put it that way. Yeah, but yeah. Ajit, I used, to th I used to tell people, I think Bitcoin's going to a million dollars. Um, I think million dollars will become the floor very soon. <clears throat> and the reason I say that now is, is that we're at, you know, 30 grand, 40 grand, whatever Canadian USD, um, and the way I get a gauge on uh, what, like, let's say normal people think about Bitcoin, like not people in my Twitter feed, right? <laughs> hey, are you there, Ajit? Or am I talking to myself? Because that's okay as well. I, I'm, I'm very much here. Oh, yeah. Please forgive okay, okay, me, okay. but go ahead. Yeah, please, that's yeah. okay. It's okay. I'll just give you a second. Uh, no, I was going to say is, is that I, I um, yeah, sorry, I was going to say, I'm just going to get it. Right not, normal, normal people unlike people on your Twitter feed. That's yeah, what so I go to Facebook. About. I go to Facebook to get a gauge where normal people are at. And to me, uh, like my family, friends, nobody cares. Nobody cares about Bitcoin. And so to that tells me that, that the world isn't even awake at all about Bitcoin. And yeah, we're having some anomaly with institutions now, really, really smart guys starting to get it a bit like in, that are responsible for blah, blah, blah. But I think we're still far away from people kind of seeing it. Um, but yeah, but yeah, no, no but, but, on, but, on, but, on, but oh, yeah, yeah, go on, ahead. On that, on, on that note, uh, you know, 
my experience is likewise people mm. who live in my apartment complex probably mm. none of them or almost none of them have bitcoin people in my high school group none of them or almost none of them have bitcoin but mm. what is different now is that uh, several of them have approached me and said hey can you tell me more about this <laughs> now they know i have been in it for like 3 years they've not asked me over the last 3 years right? but now they are asking me hey could you tell me more about this in fact just yeah. Uh, yeah. a few days ago on sunday i was to do a little get together and explain to people in my apartment complex about bitcoin it's just a because of the virus situation get togethers are not allowed and b i have been unwell as probably some of your viewers at this point can guess uh, which is why that sorry that didn't happen but over the next few days it's going to happen so i have now taken it upon myself that while i want to be part of podcast while i want to be part of the press means talk to the journalists etc but i also want to talk to people around me and you know answer some questions misconceptions prevent people from getting into a get rich quick mentality because i yeah. think that is where all the problem comes in right that yeah, i put yeah. x rupees today and tomorrow i'll withdraw with 10x right? exactly because i think that almost always fails right so it's more like so, a don't get poor slowly strategy <laughs> <laughs> long term that is so brilliant <laughs> is so it's brilliant. not a get rich quick it's a don't be poor long term and and i always tell people i used to always tell people one to 5% of your cash flow net worth if you put it in bitcoin you're not going to lose any sleep right that's like a couple hundred dollars for most people but i i still do but if to answer your question i think the dca dollar cost averaging and hodling strategy again after having been in the space since 2011 um that is the ultimate strategy and you and obviously emergencies do come up you know if if you need you know something bad happens it's some unforeseen circumstance you burn through your emergency funds whatever whatever you go or or you know when bitcoin has really mooned you know maybe you liquidate 1% 2% of your your bitcoin and and you buy that you know that 100 acre piece of property land or whatever that you want <laughs> you you, know. you are you are a bitcoin salesman <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah when it's like when when it's like 0.000001 it's like okay there are 100 acres oh, okay fine done you got yourself a deal buddy <laughs> you know that that type of thinking is i think i think interesting so but yeah but yeah but i do i do believe that hodling is good because divorcing emotion from all of this is the number one i think element and number two i think the big aha for me and i'm not saying this other people should think this for me is that not equate not having financial goals <laughs> in terms of dollar amounts but having financial goals in terms of bitcoin amounts when you do that wow. when you're like i want to have i'm at x number of bitcoins i want to have y number of bitcoins Holy shit do you work hard? <laughs> Cuz every day you're like, "Oh my god, like how how am I ever going to get there?" Whereas if you equate it in dollar terms, you're like, "Okay, I got to my goal like, you know, yesterday type of deal or whatever." Here here's something interesting <laughs> that you know, I've heard you a moment back talk about 1 to 5% of something. It may not be net worth, it may be of your risk capital. I have heard Chamath, I have heard Naval, I've talked to so, seen so many people talk about what part of their savings or or uh, risky savings or net worth should be in bitcoin uh, one of the things i have noticed is that such advice tends to assume that in general let us say people at a certain uh, risk preference or age bracket or mm-hmm. income bracket tend to behave rationally in how much they allocate to stock and bond and safe but the fact True. is they don't do that to begin with to mm-hmm. begin with they are not doing that to suddenly mm-hmm. to expect them to start doing it for bitcoins unrealistic so uh, what i would do is i would tell people that you know can you lose the dollar can you lose like 1 dollar right maybe you can so why don't you buy 1 dollar worth of bitcoin and say you know what i just it's like buying a lottery ticket you know where you don't really think you're going to get a million dollars but you could as in go take do it that way so that at least you have now got a taste of it now mm-hmm. very interestingly in india there are several exchanges who are allowing you to buy bitcoin worth 10 rupees and for your viewers who may not necessarily know the currency value of indian rupees mm-hmm. 10 rupees is something like 15 cents 15 cents 15 cents 15 yeah 15 cents mm-hmm. yeah so you could buy a small amount of bitcoin for that earlier it used to be 100 rupees which was about a dollar and a half maybe but uh the reason 
for that, I believe, is to give people an opportunity to just experience the process. Because if somebody is buying Bitcoin worth 15 cents, even if it becomes like 100 times more, it is still $15. So your life did not change, right? But so the idea is not to look upon it as you know, the, the potential to earn or to diversify your portfolio or get a new asset in. It is mm. more to show that this is not all mumbo jumbo. This is not things that happen like, you know, there's no witchcraft going on in this. It is really something where you do KYC, you have an account, you transfer money, blah, blah, blah. So I think that that may be doing a little more service because people are not going to take your advice as to what percentage of money you should You know, You know what the gonna... best, best thing is, Ajit? You just give people Bitcoin. You just <laughs> give, man. You just give. You know how many people like I've given to now that even if they don't want to believe it, if they're holding on to one full Bitcoin because you gave it to them seven years ago when it was worth whatever, obviously they're going to believe it, right? Because now they're sitting on, you know, an asset that's worth something and they're checking the price. I don't know. To me, I think getting people to use it, I think giving away Bitcoin as well is, is powerful. You know, oh, your comment about the friends. I was I tweeted recently saying that like Bitcoin has helped me reunite with more you know, old friends than Facebook because because of what you said. All my friends kind of watch me from a distance on, on on Facebook, but now a lot of them are reaching out. They're like, yo, I know I'm late to the party. By the way, if you're listening to this, you're not late to the party. The party's just begun. Uh it's about to begin. Um, but so but 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 the thing is everyone's coming back saying, Hey, you know, can you help me out a bit? Like explain what this thing is. So this is why I say is I still feel like we are far from mass adoption or even, you know, that 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 what's that bell curve, you know, that innovation bell curve we're like we're like way at the at the yeah, beginning yeah. i still i i, I think that uh, you know we got a long way to go um but another i think 10 year prediction i'll make is i think robots will use bitcoin more than humans i think in the near future <laughs> i think i think i think I'm robots totally like physical robots predictions. physical robots <laughs> like you know like yeah teslas and stuff like that who knows who knows we'll see or maybe You're dogecoin <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe that. Just like there is that innovation curve. That yeah, yeah, yeah. About, yeah. I don't know what it's called. Yeah. There's another curve that we what? should not, uh, you know, ignore, which is the Dunning-Kruger effect. Where, you know the, what the Dunning-Kruger effect is? Oh, I feel like I should. I feel like people have even mentioned it, but I kind of forget. So Remind what me? tends to happen is that when people know very little about something, so they know something, it's not that they know nothing. Like, for instance, I think, Absolutely every human being believes they know Bitcoin, however little they know. Mm -hmm. So when somebody knows so little about something that they don't know that they know very little, mm -hmm. right? What tends to happen is that their belief in how much they know tends to be very high. And then as they start really knowing more, their belief about how much they think they know keeps diving to a point. At that point, they start really believing that, okay, now I've really studied it. The problem is that most people in the society we live in are in the earlier part of the Dunning-Kruger effect as far as Bitcoin is concerned. So yeah. for instance, you know, they will ask a question such as, but what is the underlying value of Bitcoin? Now, see, if they ask a question like that, I can respond as I have responded in the past. But often when they are asking this question, they also have that smile, that smug look on their face. Intrinsic value? That, yeah. <laughs> that question? Yeah. Ajit, <laughs> what is the, I love that question, intrinsic yeah. value. <laughs> yeah. So the interesting thing is when they ask that intrinsic value question, yeah, yeah. in their head, they already yeah. have the answer. answer. They have, in yeah. their head, they have cornered me, right? <laughs> and then they are like, things like, yeah, but you one. know, which government recognizes? If I lose my Bitcoin, where can I go? And you know, you called me, I don't know how you introduced me right in the beginning of the show, but I'm so ashamed, embarrassed, and also depressed uh, by the fact that I've lost a bunch of Bitcoin of my own. I've lost a bunch because of, you know, you know how one loses Bitcoin, right? That first one keeps it on an exchange, then gets worried <sighs> that the exchange will lose it and then moves it to your own hardware wallet, yeah. this, that. Then loses it and loses the seeds. Oh, and, ooh, dude. And then how Bitcoin many... keeps increasing in price. And you're like, oh my God, kill me now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, that you you gotta stop that though. Like I know exactly what you're talking about. And that's happened to me too, but you gotta stop it. Like you will literally no, but, kill yourself. <laughs> no, but I, yeah, yeah. So I'll tell you this. But I, in my opinion, yeah. uh, 
one part which I wish was much better in this space was the custodying of Bitcoin. Because on the one hand, we can keep having any number of videos and training sessions of using Trezor and Ledger and what mm. have you. Yeah, yeah. On the, uh, and, you know, write seed words and whatever. Yeah, on yeah. the other hand, I think that uh, there might be better ways or worse ways, but even the best ways, according to me, are not good enough for mass adoption. As in, there has mm. to be some more work done on the custody element, uh, you know, that has to be as an, I, I think that that is an area which I think needs more work. hundred percent. I, I to- totally agree. Have you heard of Casa, uh, Unchained Capital, Cold yes, Card yes. Wallet? These are some, some things no. that come to mind. So I heard of Casa for sure. See, the thing is that all of them, what they are doing is they are using available methods and making them more palatable by either adding a tech layer or a process layer to it. Mm. This is great as it's better than nothing. But mm. I think that there has to be something fundamentally different, something fundamentally different. And of course, the Bitcoin algorithm, as well as, you know, other uh, crypto algorithms do allow for something to be built on top of, uh, you know, these, these software, what we call cryptocurrency. Uh, but I think much more work has to be done. Yeah, cool. I Yeah, I agree. Um... I was going to say, so anything else, Ajit, you want to share? I mean, we could probably talk about Bitcoin forever, uh, but I want to be mindful of your time. And it looks like we're kind of inching up near the end of our our 90 minutes here. So I want to make sure. Yeah. And by the way, if you want to do a follow up and we just even chat about Bitcoin, about recent events, I'm, I'm down anytime. I, I just love everyone in Bitcoin. I don't care. <laughs> oh, I, I, have, I have a bunch of questions for you. Number one. Oh, hit me up. I'm, time, I'm game. This is like a 90 minute conversation. So based on your stats, are people watching like 90 minute long podcasts? Are they listening in for 90 minutes? How's that going? Um, My mom, she's watching. She's watching okay. regularly. I've noticed uh, my wife, I've actually just kind of, I have a deal with her where she just leaves it open on the bottom of her screen. So I get the, the view counts. I learned a trick from one of my friends recently, uh, Crypto Finally, that lady, she's like killing it. She said she used to go into Apple stores and just go to all the computers and watch her own YouTube videos. So I haven't started doing that. I'm going to do that. But to answer your question, <laughs> yes, people are watching. Uh, I've probably racked up almost a thousand hours of like watch time. So I've been doing it for, for two months. I release an hour and a half every day. Um, okay. But I'll tell you why I'm actually doing it. I'm not even doing it for the necessarily hits or counts. I'm doing it because, well, I'll tell you one reason. Well, one reason was is because I felt like, like, you know, everything we were talking about earlier with that, like good or bad, whatever it is, that stuff to me is important. Like whatever, the learning lessons, the maybe the things that went wrong, maybe the things that went right, you know, the hardships. I felt like, um, Ajit, to be honest with you, that because of the coronavirus, lots of other factors, when it happened, like the, the actual victory, like Harish in the courtroom, like we finally won, right? Like Nishit Desai, like everything that we'd been working for for seven, eight years, it culminated, we won. And it was crickets. It was crickets. <laughs> nobody cared. One out of every seven human beings live in India. Nobody cares that, 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 that the Bitcoin community took on the central bank, and yes, again, through hardships, but, but again, like I also give credit to Zeb Pay and Mahin in the sense that I wouldn't have even had Bitcoin if it wasn't for, for the guys that you work with in the past. My, my point is, is that I wanted to get the story out. And in my mind, you know, if you want something, like my parents teach me about this thing called karma, you know, if you want something, you give it, right? So by giving people the opportunity to share their story, you know, in one way or the other, I'm not like demanding it, but whether it's someone like you saying, hey, Sonny, tell me your story and ask me some questions or Max Kaiser saying, okay, let's do an interview or whoever, um, like, you know, yesterday, or Monday, Sunday, I'm sitting at home. I told my wife, let's go, let's go spend time together. Anthony Diorio called me, Sonny, there's a live stream with, you know, Tone Vays and 10 other like legends. They're all like asking for you. Can you come? And Anthony Diorio is one of the founders of Ethereum. He started the Bitcoin movement in Canada. Like I, I had so much respect for Anthony. Anthony calls me, he's like, hey, come on. So 
you know, and in that time I got to share again, like not what I did. Cause I don't think I did anything. I think it was, I think, you know, like the Mahans of the world, the Ajits, the, the Sattviks, the Harishas, the Nishits. I interviewed Nishit. You want to know what my most popular uh, video is? Nishit and is Surreal. It- Ah, oh. I, everybody, Ajit, everybody. So I, I know I've already hit up Mahan, but if there's anybody in your network circle that you think you want me to interview, like Nishjal, like you would think I'd be afraid of Nishjal because he's obviously really good at what he does. He's competing with us, but I don't care. I just, I just want to, I just love Bitcoin, man. If you're, if you're into Bitcoin, um, you're, you're my friend. <laughs> so that, that's kind of a long round answer, long round answer. So I'm just trying to put a spotlight on everybody around me. And this is great. I'll refer some people to you because I can see it's so much fun talking to you that it'll be so much fun listening to you talk to others also. And I'll go and definitely look at Surail and Nishit Desai's uh, interview. It's a good one. You have to fast you know, forward maybe 30 minutes because the first 30 minutes is Surail and then Nishit accidentally, not accidentally, but he was there and Surail's like, hey, you want me to just ask him? Because it's his father, obviously. So I was actually <laughs> interviewing Surail and then Nishit just came on and Nishit is... No, no, I'm, I'm going to listen to Surail. I, I love Nishit. I, I, I love I, I Nishit. I love, love. him as much, but I'm going to do that. So here is just something interesting that a lot of people who have actually done a lot for Indian crypto uh, Nishit Desai being one, and I can think of, let's say, five to ten more names, actually are not necessarily recognized uh, as being the biggest contributors because they don't shout from rooftops, they don't know how to play the social media game, etc. 100%. But, uh, 100%. Yeah, but, I agree. I agree. I the real warriors... The real warriors, nobody knows who they are. Nobody knows who they are. Everybody who thinks, oh, this is the Bitcoin maximalist. This is the this, this is the that. No, the internet has done a good job of portraying that. But one of my main goals is to crack this zeitgeist and and put a spotlight for the good, bad, whatever. Just put a spotlight on the people who have, like you said, you know, you came into this scene and your welcoming show was... Interesting to say the least, you know, and, and, but these are the real battles. Like, you know, it's like, it's not about the all time highs. It's about the all time lows. <laughs> I should put that on a shirt. <laughs> you know, if you can endure the all time lows, you can put up with, you know, the all time highs type of deal. Right. And so, so that's what I'm passionate about. And like I said, even if two people watch my videos, I don't care because I'm enjoying talking to people. And to be honest, this is what I actually do. This is actually my job, like business development like, what am I going to do? Write a bunch of business plans? Like, I read, I could write a billion <laughs> business plans, but it's about people, right? It's about, like, connecting with people, talking to people. And, 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 and Ajit, I don't know if you know, but I was doing events. Like, I do. I love doing events, like, thousand-person events in Canada and in India. You know, that's, like, in 2000, we launched Unocoin at an event. You know, Mahin and then they did a big event back in the day, too, in Bom- Bombay, was it? or No, on the other somewhere. It was amazing. Like, events are, like, a core part of this. And I used to run one of the biggest events series, like every three months in in Toronto. Um, But then, you know, now with all COVID, this, that, you can't see anybody, but people are probably more lonely than they've ever been before. People are probably more anxious than they've ever been before. People are probably just like getting sucked into the Facebook algorithm more than ever before. So I want to (laughs) interrupt that, be the matrix and hit them with some, you know, edutainment. (laughs) That's edutainment that's my brilliant. friend edutainment you are doing the right thing you and are doing the right thing and i have often thought about doing something similar though to be right. honest i wouldn't have the guts to do like a <laughs> 90 minute or <laughs> no i actually don't even limit it some people are like hey you have more time sure let's go two hours three hours i don't care mm-hmm. man if you're talking about bitcoin i'll talk to you forever and yes right. it gets awkward sometimes you know you got to talk about some awkward things but those awkward things are fine, man. Like, you know, I'm an open book. I, I, I don't know if I told you, but I'm, I'm also part of another company called Paycase in, in Canada, which, I, which I've been kind of uh, like really involved in and we're, we're kind of doing more things. But one of the co-founders there, Kian, he was, I think, 26 a few years ago when he died. Like he literally Ooh. passed away, man, like from literally working too hard. Can you believe that? Ooh. From working too hard. Yeah, yeah. So I don't talk about these things. You know, the, the story about Satsvik and Harish being falsely arrested, you could say, because they were let go the next day. I don't talk about these things, but eventually I want to start talking about these hard things too, because, because depression, you know, suicide, all, like all, all the hard things, the anxiety, that's something I tackle in my last meeting when my call with Priya from, she was with Coinbase, A16Z, Goldman Sachs, you know, she's, we were just talking about things like anxiety because like, you know, how many people are struggling with like 
like anxiety right now, like probably everybody, right? But who's going to talk about it? It's not one of those, it's like Bitcoin, right? You, you bring up Bitcoin at a dinner table, people like, oh, weird or money. It's like people are allergic to it. But I, I do think anxiety <laughs> is one of those things that I, I also talk a lot about, you know, in terms of like, how do you hack it? Like, how do you, how do you hack it? Do you have some, you have some tricks up your sleeve? Your so, Bitcoin sleeve? Um, <laughs> so I think that uh, I wish I could give some very deeply insightful ways to deal with stress, anxiety, mm. and the like. But frankly, what I do is just take downtime. As in when I mm. see that the battles in the head are becoming a little too powerful, mm. I just take downtime. As in without planning for it, without waiting for the weekend, just take you know a sudden downtime. And that tends to help a lot. Mm. As in I don't know whether that's cure, but that helps a lot. Awesome. I think that that's a great one, right? Just simple downtime. Why not? Why not? Um, yeah, man. So it's, it's fun. It's fun. Like I said, I'm having a lot of fun with it. I've been told by a lot of people, like, why are you even doing this? Like you're wasting your time, this and that, but <laughs> I'll be honest, like my main gauge is always, uh, is always like, am I having fun? And, and, you know, I don't know if you know this, but like, I, um, like when I got my hands on Bitcoin because of, you know, Mahin and these guys, I called Mahin back in 2012 and I said, Mahin, I will come and sweep your floors. Like I need a job with you. Like I want to work in this industry. I love what you're doing. And he was the one that told me, he said, Sonny, why don't you just start your own company? Like, why don't we all just build an industry? So to me, I see everyone as like brothers, sisters, whatever you want to call it, um, as people that we're all kind of fighting the same fight. You know, sometimes, like I said, we make mistakes, you know, we take detours, we, you know, do different things. But in the end, we're all, I think, uh, kind of on the same boat. Um, Ajit, okay, so with that, where do people, and you know, a lot of people follow me like kind of globally, right, in the Bitcoin scene. Um, and so, you know, if what, what, what kind of parting words do you have for them? Where can people learn more about you? Is it Twitter? Do you have a website? Is it LinkedIn? Like, how do people tap into your consciousness? <laughs> So I, I am present on all platforms, except that as is usually the case, people have a native platform for themselves. And while that has changed over time, but for the last couple of years, it's been Twitter, where I am A J double E T K, which is K stands for my last name, which is Quran. Now there's A J double E T K. So Ajit oh. K is where you can find me on Twitter. Uh, it's been great talking to you. As you may probably know, it's close to 11 o'clock in the night where I am. And uh, it's a great way to end such a great day. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this to a close. Just hang out with me for a few seconds. 